this afternoon, we're going to talk about hog markets, of course. Uh, we're going to talk about grain markets, but uh, we're going to start with just a list of key drivers here, and we'll go through them kind of one at a time. The number one one is the same one that you've been wrestling with for the last year, and that's input prices. And it really boils down to will, will it rain, where will it rain, when will it rain, how much will it rain, and then will it be hot, hot, hot like it was last summer? Uh, I mean, lots of us are of the opinion that maybe the hot, hot, hot was worse than the dry part, especially for the timing that it came. But still, uh, the key, a key factor is going to be what happens with the weather. How, and by the way, I'm not forecasting weather. I don't do very well at forecasting economics, so I don't try weather. Uh, how will pork and hog demand hold up? Obviously, some factors here. The U.S. economy is going to be uh, one. Uh, the world economy as it affects exports, exchange rates, and, and another factor is going to be world pork supplies. And finally, prices of competitor goods, especially beef, are going to be a big deal this year. And I think that's something we've got to keep an eye on as we go forward. And also, and I'm going to say especially beef, but we're going to have to watch and see how the chicken people respond to the situation that they see right now. Just how many hogs will we see and how big will they be is going to be the supply questions, of course. December inventories suggest no reductions. Uh, some people were pretty surprised by that. I wasn't particularly surprised. I don't think the data supported much of a reduction as we went through the year. How long will weights stay relatively low is a pretty good question, and that's probably really directly related to feed prices. What will happen with packer margins and capacity? A year ago, April, or last April, pardon me, uh, this is what we looked like, and we were a little concerned about some dryness in the upper corn belt. Uh, you know, we grow a lot of corn in northwest Iowa and southern Minnesota, of course, uh, little did we know that by August, this is what the drought map would look like. And, of course, a huge problem for uh, the, especially the eastern corn belt, uh, some big hits to yields there. And now, as of January, it looks like the eastern corn belt is in much better condition, but the high plains are, are very dry, and the western corn belt remains dry in many areas and certainly in need uh, of a lot of moisture coming uh, the, later in this year. Uh, we'll talk about some specifics here in a minute. The impact of that, a corn yield that was 22% below the uh, 1960 to present trend that I use, uh, 20, almost 25% below what I call the biotech trend from 1996 on, and uh, the lowest yield since, uh, since 1993, uh, pardon me, 1995, uh, last year at 123.4 bu uh, bushels per acre. On the soybean side, the impact wasn't nearly as great, uh, about 10% below trend yield, but still, uh, coming on top of a short South American crop has really kind of made soybean meal and soybeans the price leader as we've gone through uh, this last fall and winter, and I think that's going to be changing, but still uh, a big issue is, is soybeans. We look at North America in total. We can see that the Canadians fared much better than we did. This was in April of last year, and, of course, uh, Canada had some dryness, but as we go on through the really tough times last summer, uh, we had pretty good moisture in Canada, very good uh, crops there, and right now Canada's in pretty good shape. Uh, that high-pressure ridge that set over the Midwest forced a lot of the rainfall that we normally see here up into Canada, and they had one of their better uh, crop years ever. If we look at uh, Canadian yields on corn, uh, 2012 yields up a little bit and just short of the record set in 2010. Uh, if we look at barley and wheat yields, very close to record high levels on both of those as well. So a good year north of the border. They have had some feed advantages over the last few years because of some of these kind of things and the fact that we've driven our corn prices so high uh, with the biofuels programs here. Uh, now, that doesn't make up for some of the disadvantages the Canadians have had with the value of their dollar and some price impacts of country of origin labeling. Corn stocks on December 1st, which were published last week, uh, the lowest since 2004. And so a very tight supply of corn going into this, and uh, you know a lot more animals uh, available to be fed this corn at this point. Uh, this was a pretty big shock, and USDA had to uh, balance what was available in corn stocks for the rest of the year. Uh, one of the things they did was they reduced exports dramatically by 200 million bushels, but the other one was they had to reconcile that low corn stock, which they already knew that the exports were running well behind last year's pace, and they had to reconcile that low corn stocks number, and they did that by taking feed usage down by 300, uh, up by 300 million bushels. Uh, I have contended all along that the 4.15 million a billion bushels that uh, USDA had in there for feed usage was too low. And if you, your reason for that is if you look at the number of animals 
and you try to just predict corn and DDGS usage from that, and this is a pretty good regression equation, uh, about an R squared of 0.95. It depends on December hog numbers, January 1 cattle inventory, and uh, estimates of, corn, of chicken and turkey production. Uh, this was my, this uh, equation was giving us 400 million bushels more uh, that we needed for feed than what USDA was forecasting. Uh, I, I didn't think we could reduce numbers enough to reconcile that difference. It looks like USDA has kind of agreed with that. And now they have usage numbers. They're all down from a year ago. Of course, like I say, the lowest export numbers we've seen since back in the 70s. Uh, feed usage down as low as it was in the early 1990s. If we add in DDGS, we're still down below the levels of the mid-1990s on feed availability for corn and DDGS. And so uh, we're going to have very, very tight feed supplies going through this year. That's not news. Um, the one reduction, you know, uh, uh, one of my arguments all along has been <clears throat> the livestock and poultry industries just cannot stop on a dime. Uh, I've said that ethanol could do that, and ethanol shows signs of having done that to a great degree. Uh, we see these numbers uh, from the livestock sectors, and the one variable that they can really change is end weights. And, but even that hasn't held up very well. If we look, here's hog weights, and of course you folks started adjusting marketing weights last fall, uh, trying to avoid those last few pounds of gain, and that caused a lot of hogs to come to market in August and September, but it also pulled us down about three pounds below year-ago levels, and we stay at about two and a half pounds low as we go into this year. But look where cattle weights are. Uh, steer weights up over 875 pounds. We look at broiler weights. Uh, they were lowered in the mid part of the year, but well above year-ago levels at the end of the year, and turkey weights have been well up above year-ago levels all year. What's going on? Well, it's not that feed costs don't matter, but they matter less in these businesses. In the case of cattle, it's mainly the reaction to beta agonists, uh, Zilmax, Optiflex, and their impact on the economics of that last three or four weeks of, uh, of the on-feed period for cattle and for steers. And if I showed you a heifer chart, it would look just like this, just the scale would be different. And so that has fundamentally changed. I don't think we're going back to year-ago weights on cattle at all. We're going to stay at these high levels, and we're just going to have to deal with it. In the case of broilers and turkeys, still, especially broilers, still a move in the industry to heavier birds that go into boning applications. Uh, my friend Paul Ajo with Poultry Perspectives in Connecticut says that this, that trend is going to continue for at least the next four or five years, in his, in his opinion. They are just more efficient on the farm and through the plant, and the business is going to keep making those birds heavier. The turkey business might take a breather. We look at turkey stocks in yesterday's cold storage report, a lot of turkey on hand. And uh, some reports of some real slowness on some of their business. So we'll see, but those big birds there go into boning, which goes into processed meats and deli meats and those kinds of things. And that may put some, uh, somewhat of a, a slowdown on this growth in turkey weights. But at least for now, uh, everyone's going to have higher weights. Hogs are still lower. We will be for a while. Biofuels continues to be a, a big driver, and uh, the use of corn for ethanol will continue to go up uh, for a little while. The renewable fuel standard this year for this calendar year stands, whoops, I'll get the right button here, stands at 13.8 billion bushels. If I weight that with last year's 13.2 to get a marketing year number that represents the same period as what we're talking about corn crop, uh, it'd be about 13.6 billion gallons. Uh, that would use right at 4.9 billion bushels of corn. And you recall, uh, we didn't talk about it much, but I'll run back there real quick. In the balance sheet, USDA has 4.5 billion bushels. Well, uh, there's a discrepancy there. And you say, well, how do they do that? Well, they're going to use do, make up the difference using RINs or credits that have been generated the last few years for excess uh, ethanol above the, what the renewable fuel standard required that has been blended. Now, we don't know exactly how many of those are available. Uh, there's two to two and a half billion gallons worth. If uh, USDA's forecast comes right, uh, they're going to use about half of the RINs up for this year. Uh, that would leave another one to one and a quarter billion uh, gallons worth of RINs for the future. But we have to remember that that renewable fuel standard keeps going up. And next year, it's at 14.4 billion gallons. And the next year, at 15. And at the same time, Gasoline usage is actually level or falling. 
So if you've got to blend something into gasoline and less of it is being used and you're required to blend more of it, there's a rub there somewhere. Uh, somebody's going to have to rectify that. And so we'll have to see uh, if that's done or not. But, but to do that, you've got to change the law. And I don't know if you've noticed it, Congress is not terribly effective at getting things done these days. And so I, I don't know, especially when it might be a little politically unpopular in the state that is the first one in line to choose the next president. And we will have two campaigns this next time. Let's remember that. Uh, so uh, that's an important uh, factor to remember. I think it's one of the reasons we're where we are anyway. Uh, the economics of making ethanol have not been good. You can see the reduction here when the blender's tax credit went away at the beginning of 2012, that cash returns over variable costs fell dramatically. And they've fallen again since last August when corn prices started up, so that on average, generally, ethanol plants have just barely covered their costs of corn and other cash costs and have generated hardly any return above variable costs. Now, in economic theory, which every now and then the real world fits with economic theory, uh, if you can't cover variable costs, you shut things down because you're not contributing any to your fixed costs. And in fact, uh, just like hog farms, not all ethanol plants are created equal. Some have been making a little money and others lost money even before that. But what we've seen is that a number of them have shut down. And ethanol uh, production plunged uh, last summer. It has stayed very close to this 34 uh, million gallons per day level uh, since that time. And if it averages that for the year, it will use 4.47 billion uh, bushels of corn. And recall that USDA's number is 4.5 right now for the rest for, the, for this, cal this uh, crop year. So uh, USDA is, is, is believing at least that we're going to stay at about this level of usage for the rest of this year, uh, use up a pretty good chunk of the RINs, and, and, and you can see very clearly that uh, this industry, just like us, are, are very, very dependent on having a decent corn crop this year. Cash corn prices, record high last summer. They've moderated some, and we see the futures hanging right around $7 implied price at Omaha corn with a break into new crop. Now, uh, the new crop corn is by no means cheap. I guess it's pretty cheap if you've paid $8 for it recently. But still, uh, you know, if we look at this and do the math, uh, this is kind of the same place we were a year ago. Uh, those of you who heard me at Pork Expo, I said that if it rains, we have corn below five in the fours, below five dollars. If it doesn't rain, we have corn at eight dollars. Uh, I've told a lot of audiences that everybody heard the first part and nobody heard the second part of that. Um, but I think everybody will be listening this time. And the same scenario is there. I mean. We're going to get close to 100 million acres of corn uh, planted. Uh, if you harvest 91 or 92 percent of those and you get a trend yield of 158 to 160, uh, you've got 14, 6 to 5, 15 billion uh, bushels of corn. Uh, carryouts go back up to a billion and a half or better. Uh, we can make all the ethanol we want, and you're still going to have uh, uh, probably more than we want, and you're still going to have uh, corn back down below $5. I think that's a scenario that's possible. Is it probable? Well, uh, we'll let you judge what the weather might be to do that. De distillers' grains got expensive this last summer. Normally, they would have priced themselves out of hog diets at those kind of multiples to corn. Of course, this year, because of the price of soybean meal, they stayed in because they were a protein source. They're going to stay around this top of this range, which is about 0 0.9 to 0.93, uh, the price of corn on a pound uh, equal basis, I think. Uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, the issue here, as many of you have already dealt with, is that cut in ethanol production uh, has limited the availability of DDGS, and so uh, you need to kind of keep an eye on what your uh, ethanol plant is going to do, but I, I don't know that we're going to get many more closures on ethanol plant at this point. I think they may be able to hang in uh, where they are. Uh, where will corn go? I, I think the, the, the upside uh, potential is not unlimited, but I still think there is upside in this corn market as we go through the spring. Uh, it's still going to take some tightening, probably, of feed usage to get to USDA's number. Uh, and so I think we're going to have corn trade back up uh, into the mid-sevens at some point before the crop year is over, uh, probably before we see what weather is going to be for the 2013 crop. Uh, I don't know that there are any eights in there at this point. 
Uh, we got some resistance on these summer charts there in the mid-7s, up around 770. And so I, I believe we're going to do that, and we'll see what happens on that. Wheat to corn ratio favors more feed, wheat feeding. Uh, it's certainly moved that way in the last few months. Now, this may not last either because the southwest, where the hard red winter wheat crop is, is very dry. And uh, as that develops, we might see wheat prices start going up relative to corn. But uh, in some areas, we're going to see more wheat feeding as we go through this crop year. Soybeans, USDA didn't make many changes on the January uh, WASDE report for soybeans. A little bit of a change on the, uh, on, on the uh, yield. Increased the crop a bit. They increased crushings to fit those larger feed usage numbers on corn and the fact that there are more hogs especially than what they expected. But still, a 135 carryout and 4.4% of total usage, those are the second lowest numbers on record. I mean, they're very, very low and very tight supplies. Uh, the real question here is what's going to happen in South America. Um, we've seen some playing with the Argentinian forecast in the last week. Uh, some people have rolled that back. It was wet there when they planted. It's kind of turned dry. But they're still going to have a crop that's probably 30% or so larger than a year ago somewhere in the 50 to 54 million metric ton range. On the Brazil side, record crop looks on the way. Uh, they're going to have a crop larger than the U.S. for the first time ever. 82 and a half million metric tons was the last forecast by USDA. Uh, and that's 24 percent larger than last year. The challenge here is going to be logistics. Uh, they have some new rules for trucks and truck drivers and uh, some of those kind of things, and they've always had some challenges of getting these pr products to the water. So the logistics of getting that, that, those beans to the to international markets may come into play here. But still, uh, you see the downtrend in bean meal. We've had a little bit of strength in, uh, just recently, uh, some support there just under, under $400. Uh, there's probably not a lot of chance of this breaking uh, that until we see what happens with the South American harvest. But I certainly wouldn't be booking a whole lot of bean meal uh, beyond March at this point just because the potential for a big South American crop is certainly there. What do we need from a weather standpoint? Um, well, this was the end of September, okay? And this is uh, the Weather Service's classification of uh, regions in the United States and how much rainfall they needed to get back to a neutral Palmer drought index, just to get back to even. And at that time, we had counties in Iowa that needed over 15 inches, uh, one set up in northeast, uh, north, northeast, north central Iowa, several over 12 inches. Uh, much of the Midwest, well over 9 inches of, of, of moisture needed to get back there. Now, this is that same map for last week. Uh, there's been a lot of improvement, but still, you're talking 3 to 6 to 9 inches in a lot of areas from eastern Kansas all the way up into southern Minnesota and across into Illinois. So we're not, no, whoa, I shouldn't have done that. Ah, there, we're nowhere near home free on this thing. Uh, I've been telling people, you know, well, six to nine inches kind of around here. I really hope we don't get that much water in the form of snow, Tom. I mean, that wouldn't be fun at all, especially now that the kids are all off to college. Uh, so uh, it's... Uh, but still, if that's the form it wants to take, I'll take it. No question about that. But we still need, and, and, and the question is, will we get that before harvest, before planting? Uh, if we don't, then the answer is we're going to have to have very timely rains during the growing season. And we've been there before. Some years it happens, some years it doesn't. Uh, that's kind of where we are. You can see the knife edge that we're on on this. What does it mean for cost of production on hogs? Well, my model, based on the Iowa State uh, Estimated Cost and Return Series, uh, says that for this year, uh, futures as of, uh, this would have been uh, last Thursday, I guess, uh, $93.86 on a carcass weight basis. Uh, uh, 9074 was the average for 2012. You can see that's up from 8670 in 2011 and way above where we were pre-biofuels days. Uh, that number has gone up in recent weeks. Uh, it was down as low as 90 bucks for next for this coming year, uh, just about four or five weeks ago. On the profit side, um, the model tells us uh, losses of just short of 10 bucks ahead on average for last year, and about seven dollars uh, for this year. That number has been as bad as minus 18 last summer, and as good as minus dollar 55 about a month ago. 
Uh, so uh, it's gotten worse in recent weeks, but as we've had a, a sell-off on hogs and this, uh, this latest run-up in corn prices, if you look at those profits a different way, this is just bar charts, uh, you can see that this year has certainly not been good, uh, but nothing nearly like the kind of losses, especially the length of time suffered in 2008 and 9, or even in 1998 and 99. So uh, not a good situation for producers, but... Um, uh, and, and not a lot of prospect of that getting better at the moment. Now, all of that, again, depends on rain. If you start getting rainfall this spring, you're going to have some savings on old crop corn and certainly lower uh, prices on new crop corn to help costs. Okay, demand. Um, domestic demand, of course, we need to remember that the price of the good in question does not determine demand. It determines the quantity demanded by consumers. Demand for a good is dependent on consumer incomes and willingness to pay, on consumer taste and preferences, and on the price of competitor or complement goods. The complements don't have much of an impact, so I've just got competing goods up here. Export demand is, is, is dependent on all of those same factors in the countries that we export to, and then we add in the quantity is impacted by the exchange rate because it changes the price in that importing country. So when we talk about the, the two aspects of this, first, uh, if we look at the domestic market, I'm still uh, very concerned about the U.S. economy. It's kind of stumbling along here to, you know, uh, one and a half to two percent growth per year. This is a quarterly rate here, so you see numbers in the 0.5 range. Uh, we're just not having anything kind of robust happen. My biggest concern is what's happening to per capita disposable incomes. Um, they've just been dead in the water for the last couple of years. With the only reason we have this surge in 2010 and 11 of per capita disposable income growth of over 2.0% was we were comparing those data to the per capita disposable income figures of the, dead, the depths of the recession. Uh, that year-over-year -year comparison gives us a false positive here, but if we look at this recently, the November data said that per capita disposable income was up 1.8%. That's good. <laughs> I, that's encouraging. It would be a lot more encouraging had the same report not gone back and, and, and revised all of the previous month's data for 2012 downward. And I think you're going to see the 1.8% get revised downward too. And then consider that per capita disposable income is personal income minus taxes. What do you think is going on with taxes? Well, they've already gone up. Payroll tax has already gone up. And it's very likely that some taxes are going to go up for those of us who have been defined as wealthy. And, uh, uh, you know, I can't hardly believe I even get close to that, but I guess they think I'm wealthy. Uh, but that's what's going to happen. And I, I'm concerned about both the income side and the tax side of this equation and what it means for the amount of money that people are going to have to spend. And any way you cut it, we still sell one of the more expensive food items that they have, or kind of at the top end of it, in meat and poultry in general. Uh, we can kind of see the impact of this on, on restaurants. Uh, the restaurant performance index was kind of back in the positive side, up near plus 2% at the end of last year. And as it got through the first quarter this year, it's really just kind of fallen apart. The last two months have been below 100, saying that the restaurant sector is contracting. And it's a bit of a bellwether of what's going on with the consumer demand side. Uh, real per capita expenditures for the different uh, species uh, had a good month in November. Uh, after not a very good month in October in general, uh, pork real per capita expenditures were up above $11.50, uh, well above the five-year average. And if we look at beef and chicken, they had terrific years, especially compared uh, months compared to last year. Uh, if we look at all those, put them together in the demand index, uh, interesting thing here, and that is that as of November, some of these have been negative for most of the year. As of no November, all four of them are positive. Now, nobody is a runaway positive here by any stretch of the imagination, but if that was to last until December, that would be the first time in my records that all of them have been positive for the same year. So while I'm concerned about consumer demand, the numbers say we're holding our own, not robust growth but not uh, too bad on the meat and poultry side as it is. Now, so why is per capita consumption going down? If demand's so good, why is per capita consumption going down? And in fact, per capita consumption is forecast this year to be below 200 pounds for the first time since 1990. Well, 
the answer to that is consumption and demand are not the same things. Consumption is only part of demand. The other question is prices. And the reason that per capita consumption is going down is that production is going down. Remember, we don't measure consumption by asking people how much they eat. We take beginning inventories plus production plus imports minus exports minus ending inventories, and the rest of it is this amount of product that we don't know where it went. It's disappeared. And we assume that somebody or something uh, consumed it. It's gone. And we divide that by the population, it gives us per capita consumption. So what happens when production goes up in that equation? Consumption goes up. What happens when production goes down? Consumption goes down. And that's what we've been doing, and that's the reason you see per capita consumption going down. And here's the reason demand is going up, is prices are at record levels. So what's happening is people can't afford to eat as much as they once did because we can't afford to bring them as much as they once did at those same price points. And prices are going up, the quantity is going down, but that means that demand is probably pretty good. And if we look at beef, they had record prices in November. They backed off a little in December. I think they're clearly headed for records this year. We'll talk about that in a moment. Pork prices set a record a year ago September. We bumped it very close to that this last summer. Uh, we could very well uh, follow beef upward, uh, given the relationships on that uh, w between retail prices. Chicken prices were record high in November. Uh, they're going to be close. They were close to that in December. Uh, now, whether they set new records, mm, that's not certain yet, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Of course, turkey prices have struggled some with all the supply that's on the market, and uh, we'll see them start cutting uh, uh, supplies for next year. That brings us to competing meats. It's clear that the chicken business is smaller than it once was. I mean, look at this breeder flock. It's the smallest breeder flock since 1996. Now, that doesn't mean that production's been going down because they've become more efficient as well. But of note here to me is the fact that in December, the breeder flock turned and went up. And that normally doesn't happen. It just normally is kind of dead in the water through the winter months into January and February and then starts to get larger. The fact that these companies have turned the corner and the fact that we've had some financial reports from them that may not have been too rosy, but they weren't too bad, tells me that it's very possible the chicken industry, which because of its biology can react that fast, is already looking to grow as we go into 2013 and is laying the groundwork to take advantage of lower feed prices if and when they come. Uh, I think they're getting a breeder flock in place to do that because you have to remember that they have two more decision points on production. They can still decide not to set the eggs, and they can still decide not to place the chicks. I mean, uh, they're, they're a little more willing to destroy animals than what we ever have been, and they will do it if they have to. But the big decision comes at the egg set point, and in that case, egg sets and broiler chick placements Last year, the second half of the year, were just about even with uh, the year prior. They've started out this year up over 1% on both of those. Uh, that data was released a week ago Wednesday. Uh, if you wondered why the hog market went down two bucks that day, that was a big reason. Uh, and so, um, you know, there, there's some things going on here that I think the chicken business has changed, turning the corner and heading toward expansion. And if that's the case, then we can't count on their prices being higher, especially if they're going to continue raising these, uh, these uh, birds to much higher weights. The broiler cutout begins this year. We compute this cutout every week based on part prices. Begins this year record high. It's never been this high in January before. Uh, a normal seasonal kind of pattern would take it up into May uh, or, uh, and June and then, and then kind of level off in the summer uh, months. You can see last year uh, record high were set in, in that time period as well of over $100 on the broiler cutout. Um, we'll see what happens. I think this is going above 100 here this spring. If they start seeing a good corn crop and start expanding production, you'll see some weakness in this in the second half of the year. Okay, cattle. The story in cattle is pasture. 54% uh, of the rangeland in the United States rated in poor repaired poor condition at the end of the year. Uh, we thought things were bad last year when the number was in the 40s. Uh, the main reason that that was bad was most of that 40% was in Texas and Oklahoma, which represent about 27% of the beef cow herd. This year, as you saw in the maps earlier, uh, the area is much more widespread, and there's a lot higher percentage. Whoops, went the wrong way. 
if we look at what that did to cow slaughter, well, last year's cow slaughter is the blue line. It was up uh, about 10% from the year before. This year we were down 12% relative to those huge numbers a year ago. But notice in the second half of the year, cow, beef cow slaughter was actually above its five-year average. So even uh, with the kind of promises of very strong prices, we've been liquidating the cow herd and that's simply because what you want to do in the cattle business and what Mother Nature lets you do in the cattle business are frequently two different things. And there just isn't enough pasture out there. There isn't enough hay. Hay supplies, uh, as of December 1, were record low. And if any of you have been trying to buy hay, uh, lots of luck. Um, I've been in that boat, and it hadn't been much fun this year. Uh, July cow inventory, the lowest since 46, the smallest calf crop since 49. We continue to see these supplies of uh, feeder cattle get tighter. And not only that, uh, we placed a lot of those cattle last year and into the spring, and we just basically haven't had the cattle to put on feed. We placed a bunch in November, and a lot of them were lightweight calves that should have gone to wheat pasture, which is non-existent. And we're using the grass for the cows to try to maintain a cow herd. And so if you look at the, the impact of this, uh, December uh, cattle on feed, was 700,000 head short of a year ago. Uh, that is going to start really coming into play on fed cattle slaughter here in the next couple of months, and I think we're certainly headed for uh, much higher, uh, lower, lower consumption, lower supplies, and higher prices. If we look at the cutout value, it flirted with $200 several times last year. It seems to be a resistance level, but I don't think it can keep stay below that this year, given wh how tight supplies are going to be. We think uh, beef production is going to be down four or four and a half percent in 2013, and if that's the case, uh, this this choice cutout is liable to trade up in the 215, 218 range at some point. Um, what that 138, 139 dollar fat cattle. So uh, all of that is good if you're selling cattle. Uh, it's bad if you're buying meat, but it gives us a good opportunity to market pork against very high-priced beef as we've gone through this year. Uh, I told a group last week I was making a pot of chili at home the other day, and normally that's a cheap dish to make. And before I even got started, I had $20 worth of beef in the pot, and it wasn't that big a pot. And uh, so it's amazing uh, to me, you know, kind of where this is and where it might be going. So weights remain high, lower cattle numbers, offset by higher weights, but still lower beef supplies. Cow slaughter rem has remained high. Uh, it all depends on pasture conditions. Here's the other thing. Most of these cow-calf herds had looked at this and said, look, we got to get to the spring and to rain. If it doesn't rain on schedule in many of these cow-calf areas, they don't have any hay left and there won't be any grass. I was home in Oklahoma over Christmas, and there are, there are pastures that would make a great pool table down there because there is nothing on them. And they are completely all in for rain come spring. And if it doesn't happen, uh, we're going to see more cows go to slaughter. Uh, that will put some pressure on grinding beef. Uh, on the other hand, if it does rain, you're going to see guilt, uh, pardon me, heifer retention get started. And that will tighten beef supplies even farther. And so it, it could be a very explosive situation. World economy, this was a, a year ago. Um, Moody's Analytics classify the economies, and of course, you can see Europe's a bit of a problem a year ago. If we look uh, a little over a year later, November, uh, Europe's still the big problem. And uh, we've got economies in other parts of the world growing, but uh, there's still some risk here. Uh, still, if we look at the EU, well, one of the issues, and I'm going to jump ahead here a bit, and then I'll come back, is how many hogs are they going to raise? Uh, the top line is China. It's read off of this scale. Because if I put it on the same scale as everybody else, all these other lines would just be bunched up down here at the bottom. Uh, so I spread that out by putting it on this scale. This is the EU uh, 27. Uh, the Foreign Ag Service says that slaughter there is going to be equal to, la this, uh, to 2012. Um, I've heard some people say that that's going to be down five. I've heard some others say down two. Uh, there was a report out of the EU on Friday um, that said that they thought that we were going to be down about 2% on production on EU uh, pork production. Uh, that number is obviously pretty fluid at the moment. My guess is that the five is too large. Uh, I don't think USDA is probably correct here, especially with the implementation and the, the new thing on sow stalls in, in the EU, uh, which in many cases seems to have just been ignored. Uh, I don't know how that works, but uh, I guess it works there. Um, but still, uh, the, 
not huge reductions in Europe. Any reduction there will give us some opportunities on the export side. If you look at the United States, uh, Canada, and others down here, there's some growth in Brazil, there's some growth in Russia, but other than that, pretty much the same as a year ago. Now, world supply is virtually unchanged, and I'm going the wrong way again. Here we go. Let's go back and pick these up. Uh, exports, uh, November exports were down uh, relative to last year. I, I didn't change this. That should say November. Uh, exports are still up about 2% from a year ago, year to date. Uh, we're going to set a we're going to set a, a record again this year uh, versus 2012. Now, can that be sustained? Uh, that's obviously the question. If we hit some opportunities from Europe, that will help. Boy, I'm not doing very good on this. Uh, the the markets that have really pushed things have been China, Hong Kong. Of course, China not nearly as strong as last year. Uh, Japan, Mexico have been excellent. Russia, uh, some real growth there in exports this year. Anytime things start going really good with Russia, you can bet that they're going to do something to make them go really bad. And that's exactly what they've done. And so we're going to have to overcome this ractopamine thing. But still, uh, uh, China and, 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 and Hong Kong, much less lower than a year ago, but well above uh, the, the levels that we saw up until that time. Canadian exports, record large in 2012, will decline some this year, according to FAS. One of the things to watch is what happens to exchange rates. And there's two of them of particular note. One is the Brazilian real has lost significant value in the last 18 months. Uh, and it's made them much more competitive in the markets where, you know, we kind of go toe to toe with them. The other one is, and this one is a much more recent thing, and that is a reduction in the value of the yen. When these lines go up, it means that that currency loses value. Uh, what does that mean? It means that our product is getting more and more expensive in Japan just because of the exchange rate, or it's taking buying power away from their consumers. And that's our number one value market. That's our number one muscle meat volume market. And so an important one indeed, and one to watch. Uh, someone asked last week at a meeting, they said, well, what's Japan doing? Are they taking the Bernanke lesson of money supply management? And I think that might be a big part of it. But certainly the yen is losing value, and it's losing at a pretty rapid pace. Now, the good, that's the bad news. The, the good news is that it was as strong as it's ever been going into this. So uh, it, it doesn't have to fall completely out of bed. It's something worth watching. Um, we've talked about that. So demand summary. U.S. demand indexes. Now all positive. I'm still concerned about the underpinnings of those. Uh, can they stay that way? U.S. exports expected to set another record this year. USDA, I think, has them up 4.5%. What does MEF have, Becca? Three. Three percent uh, MEF has. Exchange rate's going to be very important. Higher beef and ch chicken prices. I've got question marks on the chicken prices. Will be positive for pork demand. My biggest concern still is consumer income and expenditures. Uh, even though we sell 23, 24 percent overseas, we still sell 77 or 76 or 7 percent here at home. Uh, domestic demand is still extremely important. All right. Hog supplies. The December report came out, and it was a surprise relative to the pre-report expectations. This is the actual percentage changes year over year. Uh, this is the uh, uh, summary of, or average of estimates by analysts. You can see that virtually all those numbers are 1% larger than what expected. It put a little pressure on hog futures there for a day or two after the report. Uh, this breeding herd at 100.2 uh, got the most press. Uh, I had the breeding herd at 99.8. I didn't think we'd cut it very much, if at all, and I wasn't very confident of the negative uh, of it being under a year ago, uh, even at that. If we go forward, uh, of course, uh, supplies right at a year ago on most of the marketing categories. Uh, the other curious number in here is, is March-May feraling intentions at 98.1. That doesn't really go with a breeding herd that size and I think will likely be revised upward as we get a, a new report again in March. Uh, litter size growing at 1.3% according to USDA in the September-November quarter. Uh, this shows you where the breeding herds in the United States, uh, Canada, and the total are. Uh, we don't have any data from Canada since July since they do not do spring and fall reports anymore. Uh, this number is going to be uh, pretty flat. Uh, obviously, the breeding herd not changing a lot. Uh, but it's not going to decline very much either. Uh, if we look where so sow slaughter was, we had a surge of sow slaughter in Ju July, just when corn prices started up. 
We had another kind of surge there in September, but you can see for most of the fourth quarter, we killed sows at a slower than normal pace. And we've done that so far this year. If we look at gilt retention data, we slaughtered gilts in this part of the slaughter mix at a lower than normal rate uh, through the fourth quarter and again early this year. So I don't think it should have been a surprise that the sow herd was up. We just did not slaughter enough females to get that sow herd smaller. And some people say, well, I know of farmers in the Midwest that sold out. They went out of business. The problem is you have to remember that we, we sell out in, you know, six and seven and 800 sows, and we put new ones in 5,000 at a time. And it doesn't take very many new ones to make up for that, and we plopped several of those down even in the midst of $7 plus corn. And we're still putting some down. So uh, I don't think we're going to back this sow herd off very much at all. I don't think it's going to come down at all. Uh, Canadian breeding herd, if you look at the reductions there, and this is, uh, this is Canadian sow slaughter plus their exports to the United States. The red is the 2012 data. And you can see that they didn't really, other than July and August, they really didn't have reductions in their breeding herd that were out of normal anyway, and they were always less than the five-year average. And so uh, it's just neither side of the border has done a lot to reduce the sow herd. Uh, there's the growth in pigs uh, per litter. If we look at forecasts for this year's uh, weekly slaughter numbers, um, it's kind of a trick because you've got to go back and say what would have been normal for 2012. Uh, it was too low in the summer due to heat. It was too high in the fall due to trying to uh, reduce feed costs. And so uh, the kind of brownish colored line here is a normalized 2012 slaughter. The red is the forecast for this year. Uh, it looks like we're going to run above last year's levels for the first quarter. Uh, have a short time below, and then some relatively large increases over summer last year, and then be lower than the 2012 levels, basically the rest of the year with some large shortfalls in August and September. So it's kind of a strange pattern uh, relative to last year, but it's not this pattern that's odd. It's last year's pattern. Uh, now, how could that change? Well, if the March-May fairing intentions are indeed 1% or 1.5% low, then you could mark up these fourth quarter slaughters to be almost exactly even with 2012. So if anything, I think the risk is having more pigs in the fourth quarter than what the, the report said. Weekly hog slaughter in Canada, I tell them, you know, this thing has, this chart has looked the same for like eight years. It just doesn't change. Uh, they have not changed their slaughter there. Our imports from Canada have stabilized somewhere in the 80,000 pigs per week range. We had a very low week uh, there at the end of the year. I think we're going to be back in this range. Uh, breeding stock and, and market hogs also very stable. Uh, what will happen if country of origin labeling changes? Um, I, I think it will put an incentive in to bring some more pigs from Canada because it won't be quite the problem to handle them. But all that depends really on how we go about changing it. That is not known now. The World Trade Organization has said the program, as it's defined, violates our trade agreements. And so we have to change it. Whether we can change it by just rewriting the rules or whether Congress has to change the law is a major point of discussion right now. Uh, there are some that say, oh, we can just rewrite the rules and it'll be okay. I don't know. I, I know what that law says, and it's pretty prescriptive, and so I don't know if you can you've got enough wiggle room to change the rules. And if it takes Congress taking action, well, you know what I said well ago. Um, they do have a farm bill this year that they could attach it to if they want to make the changes, but uh, nobody knows exactly how to do, go about this. And uh, uh, I think the dead, drop deadline, deadline is in August. Uh, my guess is that the day before that deadline happens, we'll get something done. Uh, the Canadians and Mexicans can retaliate on anything they darn well please to retaliate on. Okay? It doesn't have to be beef and pork, even though that's very logical that it will be. Uh, they could go after others. And I think really what foreign governments do when they do this is they go down to Washington and they say, who's got the most effective lobby? That's who we're going to retaliate on. Because they want somebody that can go into Congress and get this thing changed, if it has to be. And, uh, and this is one of those things where having a really good set of people in Washington, D.C. may hurt you, okay? Because they're really good at what they do. You probably have more sway in Washington than you deserve to have because of the good job that your folks do in Washington, D.C., 
and this one, it makes you a target in this case. Uh, but hopefully we'll get that settled and it'll be behind us. Uh, I, it was, it was as, uh, as Rod Smith wrote about something a few years ago, it was a bad, 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 bad idea whose time had come. So, anyway. Uh, meat and cold storage, the cold storage report came out yesterday and was not very positive. Uh, all meat and poultry up 12.2%, pork 14% higher than a year ago. Uh, and the problem is an odd one. It's ribs. I mean, ribs accounted for half of the increase and almost 40% of the total amount of pork in, in, in cold storage. It's amazing how many ribs are in cold storage. I, I mean, I've eaten my share. Who, who, who hasn't held up to this deal? Um, but ribs have been, a, and they've been a problem since, well, last spring. Normally, they're a summertime item. They just didn't move this year. Now, I'm going to offer one thing that might be the, ca the case, and it, I'm sure it's a contributor, and that is ribs are one of the cuts that the size of the cut, because of the size of the hog, has become a problem. All right? That's one cut that you don't do that much changing the size of it. I mean, it, it's the same size as it comes off the critter. Okay? That's one of those things where the size of pigs may be hurting us because it increases the value of a slab of ribs and the cost of a plate that goes into a restaurant. They have to jack their prices up. You could be getting some pushback. But ribs, major par portion of this cold storage problem. Uh, average weight for barrows and gilts we talked about earlier. A remarkable job of getting those weights down last fall. There was a price to be paid, though, and that was we ran a lot of hogs for a few weeks trying to get those weights down. And you can only do that for so long. But still, we ran about three pounds lower. We're down two and a half as we go into here, uh, into the year. I think we're going to stay probably two to two and a half pounds lower, at least until the hot weather gets here or we get some uh, cheaper feed. Uh, pork production up 1.8% week before last. Uh, I think it's going to be higher right at, maybe just a bit higher uh, than last year, all the way through April. Remember, slaughter is going to be higher. Uh, weights will be down a bit, but I think the, the, the balance of that will still give us more pork production. Uh, pork cutout value begins the year at about the low 80s. A normal kind of runout would take this up into 100 to 104 uh, range, uh, pardon me, seasonal increase, 100 to 104 this summer. On hog prices, kind of the same thing, a normal kind of seasonal. Of course, you can see last year we had anything but a normal seasonal pattern. Would put us right around 100 bucks on net prices. This is producer sold, negotiated net prices this summer. Uh, my forecast for slaughter, I've got the first three quarters up just a little bit. Uh, that third quarter would be lower if it did not have one more slaughter day in it than last year. Uh, and then, of course, the fourth quarter right now down 1.8%, subject to March, May farrowings. Uh, I've got slaughter up two-tenths of a percent for the year, very much in line with uh, Ron Plain at Missouri and Lee Schultz up at Iowa State. And the Livestock Marketing Information Center, a little more optimistic from, uh, from a price standpoint, anyway, about supplies. If we look at price forecasts, uh, national net negotiated price uh, is what I forecast, mid-80s here in the first quarter, uh, up into the upper 80s, low 90s in the second, low 90s in the third, uh, back down in the mid-80s in the fourth, pretty close to what the other forecasts are, not too far off. Here's the futures as of the uh, day before yesterday, and you can see that they're not too different than where our forecasts are. I don't think there are really any pricing Big pricing opportunities there. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is it's January. And normally any kind of seasonal rally will carry the futures complex up with it. And if that's the case, you still may get some chances to sell uh, those summer hogs uh, better. Why is, did we not get such a reduction? I mean, uh, this, I've used this for a long time. It's kind of a measure of producer well-being. It's accumulated profits, selling one pig per month and putting the profits in a in a, a savings account or a mayonnaise jar. Um, that they're kind of equal as far as what they pay. Um, and the, the amount in that jar would have gotten up to about 800 bucks back in 2007 before the big adjustment on feed prices. Uh, it climbed up, didn't get half of that recouped. And here's where the futures say it's going to be for the rest of this year. Now, the bad news is that's not a very pretty picture. The good news is that pink line went down below zero uh, back last fall. Okay, so it was a lot worse then. Uh, I, you never are very popular telling people they're a lot better off than they should have been, so I won't go there. Um, but the point is, is that this would suggest that financially, uh, we shouldn't have had this much staying power through this thing. Uh, there's a couple of things that could be wrong with that. Um, 
Uh, number one is, uh, during all the fall and winter, the futures for next summer were awfully strong. There was a lot of incentive out there to keep producing. Uh, because those pigs, when you were breeding sows, uh, you know, in August, September, October, uh, they're going to farrow for pigs that are going to, could have been locked in at $100 or better on many of them for June, July, and August next summer. So that's part of it. Uh, the second one is, uh, most bankers that I talk to think that the financial position of producers is a little better than my model for a couple of reasons. One is, my model is an average. Uh, I'm not sure there is an average producer anymore, and there are a lot of folks that are probably better than what this model uh, specifies for cost. The second one is, uh, my model uses cash purchases of feed and cash sales of hogs completely, because I don't know what, I, I don't know what would add, how I would ever put in any kind of hedging on an industry-wide basis. Uh, a lot of you are a lot better at managing margins than you were 10 years ago or even five years ago. You do a better job of hedging feed costs. You do a better job of hedging hogs. Uh, you have contracts that take out some of the variability. And all of those have meant that producers are a little better off than what we thought they were and probably have a little more financial staying power. This is what I do. I mean, you're, you're a headstrong lot. And this is what you do. This is your expertise in the world, and you're going to stick with it. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, intentions here and uh, uh, desire to stay in the hog business. Uh, I think it's safe to say, though, that we're all betting on rain. I mean, just like the Cowboys are betting on rain, I think we are too. Because I don't know that there's enough financial uh, staying power there to survive another one. And uh, if that's the case, you might finally get that massive liquidation that some people were talking about last fall. Long-term issues, cost, 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 equal prices, prices, prices. We're going to see a dry run of this with the, with the, beef, with the beef guys. They're going to have very expensive product. How will consumers react? What if we get there and have to have prices that are significantly higher than we are now? Uh, all of these costs have got to be passed along, and if we stay at these kind of levels, you know, we're not passing along 90-some dollar break-evens yet to consumers. Uh, that prices would have to go up to do that. Uh, animal welfare issues, of course, you got chronic challenges. Stalls, um, you know, I don't think this is a logical thing by the buyers of pork. Uh, they don't understand the system. They don't understand how hard it is to do. Uh, but, and I think we've made some headway in teaching them about this, but I'm still afraid that that ship may have sailed. And uh, it's going to be something that we have to deal with, uh, either to fight it or to, to make the adjustments uh, to raise pigs without stalls. Uh, uh, the important part on that is, so far all the agreements have said you can keep them in stalls for 35 to 42 days after you wean them. And my understanding, and I'm not an animal scientist, uh, is that that is the critical thing for productivity. Does anybody in here trust HSUS to leave that in place? I don't, and if that thing goes away, then we've really got a problem on our hands. So I think that's the really important part of it. Castration, tail docking, they're on the list. Get ready for them. They're coming. And finally, I think, you know, I think ultimately you're going to really have to defend the fact that you have hogs in barns. Now, that's easier to do in January in Iowa and Minnesota than it was when I was a kid growing up in Oklahoma. I understand that. But, you know, when I talk to people, and some people... Some aren't very knowledgeable of livestock, and others know a little bit about it. Uh, and many of them were around when we raised a lot of pigs outdoors. Lots of times the discussion comes down, well, if you just didn't have them indoors, uh, and usually crowded indoors, you wouldn't have to have, do that tail docking, and you wouldn't have to have all those antibiotics, and you wouldn't have to have this, and you wouldn't have to have that. And uh, I think ultimately we're going to have to defend raising pigs indoors. Uh, it's going to be uh, one of the things that gets on the docket. Uh, risk management skill is going to be important. Policy issues, antibiotics is going to be on there. The farm bill, uh, we probably don't have as many risks on the farm bill as we had the last time around. I don't think we're going to see another gypsy rule situation come out of this farm bill. Uh, but um, you never know with the cats that are in Washington these days. <laughs>